Joining me now is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband, the former British Foreign Secretary and a son of refugees. David Miliband, thank you for being with us. This annual report, thank you, much, John. you know, this is these headlines really represent millions and millions of people starving, uh, women victimized, rapes in Sudan. Uh, I've seen the refugees there myself going over to Chad, coming over from Sudan, uh, which UN officials and others say is another genocide, which is what took place there in 2004 and 2005 in East Darfur. And now you have Gaza, where the whole world can see what's happening. Uh, your yeah, annual report right. is so important right now. Thanks very much. You're right to put this into historical perspective, because the number of people in humanitarian need around the world, the number of people who need the support of aid groups to survive, has increased fourfold in the last 10 years. 300 million people around the world in humanitarian need, which sounds like Mount Everest. But what our report shows is that these 20 countries, just those 20 countries, represent about 86% of total humanitarian need. And so what we uh, draw out in our report is, first of all, three big trends, that the conflict and climate crises are coming together, that civil wars are being internationalized with sponsorship from outside, and that the economic impact of higher interest rates is being felt. So those are the trends. But we also point to the things that need to be done to try and remediate this situation, because your reporting has also shown just like with the opening of the Kerem Shalom crossing that you've mentioned, there are things that can be done that can save life. And we all have a duty uh, to argue for that and try and do that uh, if it's in our power to do so. And number two on the watch list, of course, is the Palestinian territories, Gaza, the West Bank. Uh, what is the critical, you know, tipping point that people need to know about there? Well, I think that the fact that the Secretary General of the UN should last week have summoned an extraordinary meeting of the Security Council because of a threat of disorder uh, tells you quite how serious the situation is. 20,000 people killed, uh, the number of displaced that you've referred to. Our conclusion from a humanitarian perspective is absolutely clear. It's impossible to deliver aid and it's impossible to protect civilians while the fighting is going on. That's the humanitarian case for the ceasefire that you've covered on previous programs. Now, we can also and must ameliorate the situation literally minute by minute, hour by hour. There's an International Rescue Committee team in uh, Egypt at the moment. Uh, we have medical expertise. We have expertise in containing contagious diseases. Uh, we have partners inside Gaza. But it's impossible to work while there's such threat to life and limb from the fighting. And so the conduct of the war makes the humanitarian work impossible. I also just want to pick out one other thing that you um, uh, referred to in passing. You referred both to Gaza and to the West Bank. That's important too. Uh, the health system, according to our partners, in the West Bank, uh, where there are millions of Palestinians, uh, is also under extreme uh, duress and under extreme uh, threat. We know that Israel suffered a terrible trauma on the 7th of October with the terrible Hamas attacks. Now there is a trauma for Palestinians as well. And as a humanitarian organization, it's our duty to speak for all civilians without fear or favor, whatever their belief or their identity or their religion. Now, Israel, of course, is saying that they have to get the Hamas leaders who are using hostages and Palestinian civilians as human shields and embedding themselves beneath hospitals and in tunnels. So is there a way perhaps the way that the U.S. is pushing for periodic pauses to get the aid in and get enough of it in, because it's not been going in with, you know, 500 or more trucks a day, not even through Rafah, and to open up this second opening from Israel, which has not been open. Well, obviously, any pause is better than no pause, but we've got the experience of the pause of three weeks ago when hardly any aid was able to reach people, when far too few were able to get out, and when, of course, the hostage uh, release w was uh, present, but then stopped, and there remain 140 uh, hostages there. We understand why the conflict in Gaza, the war in Gaza, is getting all the headlines. But the purpose of our watch list is also to make the point that there's a range of other crises as well, where there's also a suffering that is attendant on the 
uh, inability to uphold the most basic standards that civilians have a right to expect. And those civilian rights in war are to aid supplies and to protection. Uh, that is the foundation of the international regime that's been established after 1945, and it's so important that it is defended. We refer to the conduct of the uh, war, which obviously speaks to the conduct of both sides. And it's very, very important that those fundamental humanitarian principles are articulated and upheld, not just in Gaza and the West Bank, but elsewhere as well. Well, you've, of course, you list Sudan. I was there in September with Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the UN ambassador, who was trying to shed a spotlight on this and who you know, went to the border, uh, walked and talked with the refugees. Uh, and the world is really ignoring it. With, I mean, that's a great point. That's Security Council meetings on it, but you know that's not even a UN camp. That is a, a camp setting up to become a UN camp. That's uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Borders tent hospital. Children are dying. Um, infants are coming across. They, there's, they have such malnutrition that only one in ten uh, is surviving. And the, the women are being raped in their villages, the villages burned, the men are being killed. Look, this is a really important point. We have an international rescue t committee team in Sudan, but also in Chad and in South Sudan. Incidentally, it's interesting, for all the talk of refugee crises in uh, America or in Europe, the refugees from Sudan are in poor countries like South Sudan and like uh, Chad as well. I mean, the Sudan case shows how climate and conflict are coming together. It shows how international actors are supporting rebel groups or government sides in a conflict that seems to be without end. And it obviously has these terrible historic echoes as well. Uh, you referred to malnutrition, I think rightly. I think your viewers would be shocked to know that today, 45 million children under the age of five are acutely malnourished in the world, and 80% of them are not getting the help that they need. That's the kind of work that international humanitarian organizations try to do every day and why we need to be able to garner the support to be able to do it.